Okay, so I just want to welcome everybody today. My name is Alicia Smith. I am the Director of Alumni and Donor Relations here at Georgian Court. And this is What's New in Nursing, a conversation with the Dean. We have um, Bonnie Ross with us today. She is the Chair of the Nursing Department and the inaugural Dean of the Georgian Court University Hackensack Meridian Health School of Nursing, Terry Wormser. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Bonnie to get us started and please enjoy the webinar. Hello everybody, I'm Barney Ross and I am uh, the current department chair of the BSM program in Georgian Court School of Nursing. And I'm here with Dean Terry Worm Wernser. Would you like to just say hello? Terry? Hi everybody, How, how's everyone today? Glad to be here with all of you. So we're really happy to be here. And this is just an informal chat between the two of us. And we're gonna try to talk about the background of the nursing program. Um, Dr. Wormser is gonna tell us a little bit about the background that she came from and how we got to today and what's going on now and maybe what the future of the program and the school look like. So Terry, do you wanna start by telling us a little bit about your background in nursing and how the program was started? Sure. Um, I actually started um, my nursing career right out of high school in a diploma program. So I graduated from the Kings County Hospital Center School of Nursing. And that was a city hospital in the center of Brooklyn um, uh, many, many years ago. Um, once I graduated from there, I worked in the intensive care unit. Uh, the intensive care unit then was not like what we have right now, but uh, for me, it was very, very challenging and exciting at the time. Um, my husband at the time um, uh, really um, told me that I needed to go back to school and get my bachelor's. That was his best insurance policy for me. So I went kind of kicking and screaming back to get my bachelor's because I felt that, you know, I was working fine as a nurse in the ICU. Um, after several years working in the ICU, I decided uh, that I would go back for my master's in public health and hopefully try to prevent people from going to the ICU. So really focusing on prevention. Um, after completing my NPH, I spent time at the New Jersey Department of Health as a health planner that was in a nursing um, um, position. Um, but I got the opportunity to help to write the state health plan and learned a lot about planning for health services for the state and got to learn a lot about um, uh, policy in the state. Um, traveled to Trenton after a while, got a little bit old with a young child. Uh, it took me like an hour both ways. So um, I stayed on as a consultant and that's when I started my teaching career so I could spend more time um, with my daughter. Um, uh, and uh, so I started actually teaching at a local community college, uh, first as a clinical instructor, then as a lecturer, and um, applied for a full-time position, which I did not get, <laughs> and was devastated at the time that I didn't, um, I wasn't hired into that position. But uh, what I realized that everything happens for a reason, and it was actually for the best, that um, I did not, almost immediately after not being hired, I was uh, asked to um, uh, take a job with the State Nurses Association where I worked with HIV and AIDS education. And, and um, uh, I actually was administering an HIV AIDS education grant. Uh, at the time I knew nothing about HIV and AIDS, but the director of NJSNA told me that I would learn and certainly I did. And uh, that to me was really a great eye opener. I learned so much about education there and how you know, to help change behavior. I learned about um, um, you know, the HIV pandemic at the time um, and um, through the eyes of my new network of HIV uh, AIDS nurses, I met a gay male, male nurse who had AIDS and who decided that he would help me with my educating the state about HIV and AIDS. And he was, um, he was just such a wonderful person and, and we went all around the state and I got to meet so many uh, different people. At the time, AIDS was a, a death sentence and he has uh, since died. Uh, everyone died and those, um, there was so much fear um, uh, you know, about getting AIDS among healthcare professionals. And this was a, uh, actually the population that I really came to love. Um, the HIV grant um, um, 
ended after about three years and we had accomplished our goals and I decided, all right, now it was time to go back to school and get my doctorate. So I went back to Adelphi um, and um, almost immediately I got another phone call uh, from Dr. Rich Hader at Meridian Health asking me if I would uh, come and work with him. And um, he asked me to close the diploma program that had been with uh, Jersey Shore for many, many years, since like 1904. So, you know, I was really popular then to close the school and, um, and then to, uh, to start a center for nursing excellence. Um, so, you know, that was quite a challenge and, and very interesting. I got to do so many, so many really interesting things. Um, uh, after 10 years of, after I closed the school, after 10 years, Rich Hader came back to me and asked if I would open up a school with Georgian Court because he felt that we needed a baccalaureate program in um, Ocean and Monmouth County. And that was quite a challenge, but we accepted the challenge, um, myself and a couple of other doctorally prepared nurses at Hackensack Meridian. And um, we put together this program that was in 2008. Just a couple of other experiences that really have impacted on me is for about 20 years, um, I um, um, traveled with my husband to third world, world countries on medical missions. And I really got to learn a lot about population health and really about other cultures. Uh, we traveled to the Philippines, Vietnam, and some countries in South America. So that really gave me a very wide perspective on global health. So that's, uh, that's my story. What about you, Bonnie? Well, my story um, is not as interesting as yours, but I would have to say that um, I'm listening to your story and I realize that I never realized this before, Terry. Um, I have a lot of experience with the AIDS population as well really? in a different way, which is mm -hmm. something I'll bring in. So I went to school, um, traditional BSM program, University of Delaware, and graduated feeling like I could conquer the world and went out to a med surg unit. That's what many nurses do and still do these days just to get a good baseline. And then from there, I went to ICU and CCU and um, I was, you know, we were primed to go for more school. So within a year I went, um, I applied and I got into NYU for my um, master's. And this was in the early eighties. And I was um, going to school in New York while working in um, CCU, ICU in Northern New Jersey. And I was hearing about um, this, this type of a patient that they were seeing in downtown in the city mm -hmm. with, AIDS, which we didn't know it was AIDS yet. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing about this. I remember exactly where I was sitting, thinking about this. And then within the year, seeing them in my own practice. And if we can relate to it a little bit today because of what's going on with the pandemic and having these stories to be able to share with our students, letting them know that it's okay. We did this before. We did this back in the 80s. It wasn't the same thing, of course, but that's what nurses do, that we, we take care of people and there's always going to be emerging illnesses and things like that. So that was a pretty influential time. I went to school. I got a master's in um, delivery of nursing services at the time, which was like an administrative track. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, I did get married as well. And I was um, moving around a lot. I did a lot with case management. Quality assurance was brand new. That was the 80s also. So that was the big topic was quality and safety. It was the emergence of all that that we all know and love right now. And then um, later on, I wanted to go back to the bedside and I was raising young children and I was working in intensive care again, the PACU. Um, so similar to you, Terry, when um, my littlest one went to uh, school, I went back and I joined education. So that was almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I did it also for the same reasons. Isn't it funny? I didn't know that we had the similarities to have more hours to spend with my family and to be able to be there with the kids when they had their homework. And I started at Brookdale Community College, which is um, you know, obviously in, in Monmouth County. And I started as a clinical adjunct. And then I loved teaching so much, I got into the full-time position. I was um, started department chair there. And then I pursued my EDD, which is the doctorate in educational leadership at Rowan University. And when I graduated and I defended, I knew I wanted to do more. And I looked in the ads and I saw there was an ad for Georgian Court. And I had been fortunate enough to meet um, and to know Terry um, back in 2008, I think it was, because the 
Brookdale had just gotten a large grant and it was a grant to build up the community, of course, it's the community. And we were developing an online nursing program, but we were also um, leveraging resources with local um, facilities, including Meridian, um, which it was called Meridian at the time. So when I um, was looking for something else to do, I saw that Georgian had a part-time opening and I reached out to Terry and I became as a visiting professor at Georgian and um, I totally fell in love with this, the school, the culture, the students, and um, I applied as a full-time faculty and I got the position in 218. So I've been here ever since and um, asked to be department chair this past year, which I'm thrilled to do. So. One of the reasons I just have to say that I really loved, um, you know, I wanted to be part of this program because of the growth of the program and how much um, the program has grown so significantly. So that leads me to my next um, question, Terry. We've seen a lot of changes in the program and how is that impacting um, and everything that's going on in the world? What's going on with our program now? What's going on with nursing? Um, what do you what do you want to um, what do you see for our program and for the school? Okay, so after putting our program together very rapidly, we did it like within a year. Uh, um, we started actually with a class of about thirty five and wound up graduating in two thousand and twelve thirty graduates who are now in the community doing wonderful things. Um, we have now grown to over three hundred and fifty nursing students, which to me is just remarkable. Um, we've been accredited twice with no recommendations from the um, uh, CCNE, which is our accrediting body. Now, that's pretty unusual. Usually they have something to say about your program, but they really liked our program. Um, and right now we want to continue to grow. Our, our vision is really to continue to supply well-prepared, compassionate nurses who are the future of healthcare. They're going to be the future of healthcare. Uh, since starting the program, we expanded. We have a very small RN to BSN program. Um, and most recently, um, we just got approval to start an accelerated BSN program, uh, which we're very excited about. Now, an accelerated BSN program um, is for people who have bachelors in other areas. So maybe they're working in business or um, social work or I don't know, they could marketing, they could be working in other areas, have a, a degree, and they're able to fast track to nursing in a year. So they can, usually it takes four years, they can um, become a nurse uh, in a year. Very rigorous program, they can't work during this program. They really have to devote themselves and be committed to the program. Um, but we feel that, especially now, um, that there are many people who are looking for a more meaningful career, something that, um, you know, that really gives them satisfaction. And so we're excited to accept our first class and we're hoping to start that in 2021. So that's one of the, uh, one of our plans. Uh, we're also working on developing, the faculty's working on developing masters and possibly a doctoral program in the future. So I'm hoping that sometime in 2021 or 2022 that we'll be able to get approval to do um, first a master's in education and then uh, some uh, advanced practice or nurse practitioner programs in the future. Um, another very exciting thing is when we started the program in 2008, uh, we were assigned Hamilton Hall, which is our current home. Um, and um, the school built us, you know, a, a learning lab. We had a couple of classrooms. Um, it's kind of an unusual building. It's a lovely old building. Uh, it has a couple of um, fireplaces and, but it's really not made to be a nursing building. Um, it has served its purpose. It was renovated a couple years ago. They actually put an, an elevator, didn't have an elevator at the time, had an, has an elevator but uh, has so much charm, but there are problems with older buildings. Um, um, but we really have outgrown it right now. Uh, the space and as te uh, technology and simulation are becoming more and more important than ever, we are really in the need of a new home uh, to which Dr. Marbach is working tire tirelessly to make a reality. So in the plans are to create a nursing health and wellness building um, which I think they're talking about in 2023. And maybe Alicia can show the initial renderings of that building. Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and share it. Hold on one okay. sec. Okay. 
Can you see that? I can. I hope everyone else can. I think so. This is just the um, this is the new Center for Nursing Health and Wellness. Mm. It's beautiful. And it's going to be um, in that long road all the way down towards the fountains for for the alumni who who know uh, where that is. So it'll be where the I think it's the Italian gardens are right now. And um, it'll take up a, a lot of space. We're hoping uh, there'll be other uh, departments that'll be in the building with us, but we're planning, we're working with architects on a brand new simulation center, state-of-the-art simulation center. Uh, we do simulation currently, but we really need to expand on that. So we'll be putting that in. And we're also hoping to put in a little um, maybe health services department where we, where our students, especially if we uh, develop an NP program, a nurse practitioner program, they can actually see patients there. So this is really exciting. And um, we are so looking forward to um, that opening in the future. We really, really are. I agree with you 100%. We do have some other slides to share about what we're doing with our students and in the lab and some other nice things about the students. But I think I'm gonna stop sharing for now. Maybe we can talk a little bit more and then we can get to that at the end if that's okay with everybody, with you, Terry. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll get back to, hi. So um, the next thing is let's, can we talk a little bit about this past year? It's been really challenging for all of us um, so how do you feel like COVID-19 has impacted the nursing profession and nursing education? You know, COVID, I think, has impacted on every, every part of our lives, right? Not only for nursing, but every, everything that we do right now. But it has actually been a really remarkable year for nursing. First of all, 2020 was the year of the nurse. We were looking forward to celebrate in the, um, I think it was Florence Nightingale's, right? And her 100th anniversary. And we were so excited to celebrate the year of the nurse, which we really haven't been able to do the regular celebrations that we had planned. Um, but it certainly has been the year of the nurse, I think, anyway. Um, nurse, nurses really rose to the challenge. Um, um, of taking care of patients, but it was challenging for them. It was really um, difficult, uh, a difficult time. Um, I actually did an elective for RN to BSN program um, nurses, students um, during, the, um, during the pandemic. And uh, the title of it was Nursing in the Pandemic uh, and thought I would share some of their quotes from the class because I thought that um, it was, it was heart-wrenching for me uh, hearing their stories. Well, first of all, I asked them um, if they would um, put together a time capsule. What do they want to tell themselves or their children or their grandchildren in 10 years? So I'll just read you one of them. So one of them said that she would include in her, her time capsule a Bible with a letter from Pope Francis about the pandemic, toilet paper, hand gel, current day PPE, N95s, gowns, gloves, newspaper articles about the pandemic, pictures of empty grocery store shelves, a picture of lines outside of grocery stores, a self-written letter as a nurse describing what it was like living through this time. She'd like to include a survivor's account of coronavirus, a copy of the quarantine guidelines as per the government, a Google Earth picture of before quarantine and while under quarantine. A picture of Times Square at the rush hour before and during the quarantine. Pictures of people in social situations with masks on. So all of them included toilet paper, by the way, in their time capsule, which I thought was uh, actually pretty humorous. But um, when they were describing what they went through, um, one said, I've learned many things from this pandemic. I've learned firsthand that COVID-19 does not discriminate between the young and old, the rich or poor, black or white, religious or secular. In the course of my work, I have seen large scale death among the patient population, along with sadness, fear, and at times hopelessness in the eyes of my colleagues. I learned that in spite of my own fears of illness, I was able to rise to the challenge of compassionately caring for my patients. 
I learned that social isolation, although a necessary evil, is a fate that most people, including myself, hope not to have to relive. I saw that the human spirit is alive and well in times of turmoil. Kind words, thoughtful cards, nourishing meals were all extended towards me and made me grateful for humanity. So those are the type of experiences yeah. that our nurses um, and our graduates, we put out many graduates who started working as graduate nurses um, into something they had never experienced during their time in our program. And I was worried about them. I was really, really worried. Um, you know, We tried to prepare them, but I don't know that we could prepare them um, for what they really had to see at that time. But again, they rose to the challenge and they're, you know, um, they have stories to tell as well. So um, in terms of um, uh, our nursing program, our students uh, had to get used to remote learning. Uh, we've given them options for lectures to come to class. And many of them are de actually declining right now. Um, faculty are working harder than ever, I think. Um, as they are recording voice over presentations, they're meeting with their students uh, synchronously online. They're adding and learning about active learning modalities. Uh, they're having multiple meetings one-on-one -on -one with students who need additional help. We're meeting, we used to meet like every other month and now we're meeting every week to talk about what we need to do. Um, uh, we had to, when in the middle of the COVID, when we could not bring our students to campus, uh, we had to be really, really creative. And um, we actually had uh, bought a, uh, a lab in a bag where we sent them home with body parts so that they could practice on because um, they had to do home learning, how to teach. On, uh, we had to learn how to teach online um, uh, and our technology. We really came to depend on technology really heavily and realize that there's so much out there if we could only afford to, um, you know, to get it for our students right now. Um, anything you'd like to add? You were, um, you were so wonderful in bringing in new technology, Bonnie, and helping the faculty to become competent and confident in what they needed to do with our students. Thank you, Terry. That was really nice for you to say. I, um, after I learned how to, I developed the online nursing program at Brookdale, Brookdale, or maybe was the curriculum coordinator. And I never dreamt that I would have to bring those experiences back the way that, um, or the things that I learned back this way. But I have to say that I was just a little piece of the whole puzzle. We had um, faculty, we came together. And when you speak about meeting every week, that was just online just rehashing and meeting with students constantly, having town halls constantly. And the amount of information that was pouring in at us at this, that time, if we go back, was tremendous. So I do have to um, send kudos to the faculty for coming together and working so hard and flipping this. And this wasn't just our nursing faculty. I know it was the Georgian court faculty. We had, um, a, we had tremendous support from our teaching and learning center, which has continued throughout. Um, we have a lot of technology at our fingertips right now. There's a lot of, um, we call one of the products we just integrated um, something called vSIMS or virtual SIMS through a company called Lippincott. But um, so we're bringing in new things all the time for the students to, to use. Um, but they do, I do have to be honest, it is all very expensive and we're doing the best we can with it. So we do have to be creative at the same time. But what this, pandemic has meant for the faculty is it's shown the spirit of, of nurses, even nurses who can't be working at the bedside, but how we really wanted to support our students through this. So I was really proud to be part of this team. Yeah. We want to talk a little bit about the, the boot camp because oh, yeah. they yeah, were. Yeah. So, so what happened? Camp. Yeah, I'll be glad to share that. So what happened was it was mid semester when the students um, we were pulled in and nobody could go to clinical anymore. So we had to come up with these experiences, these virtual clinical simulations and things like that. But it was felt that um, the students really missed out on six or seven weeks of, of, of skilled building um, clinical situations. 
So um, we decided to run a boot camp toward the end of the summer, a week before classes start. And, and we were very fortunate because in New Jersey, we were able to have that lull in the cases. So it was safe enough to come back in. And so we, um, under the lead of our, our, um, our lab instructor, we coordinated this boot camp where um, a few of the different courses of students. So I can't remember how many students we had all together, maybe 150, 200 students that came in over a course of a week and we socially distanced them. We took their temperature before they came in. They had to sit in their cars. They were checked in. We were only allowing, you know, six, you know, five um, students in a room at a time. And we did this whole boot camp where we brought the students back in and, um, I have some pictures to share perhaps at the end with all of these things that we did with them, but it was a tremendous effort on the whole faculty's part. Um, and the students really felt good coming back because it was all about the skills that they had missed. So um, they were really not ready, but they were more ready, more confident to get back to clinical this semester. So it was, it was completely successful. Um, we had adjuncts come in early clinical adjuncts. It was, it was, it was a true team effort. Um, and and the students loved it. They oh, really, the students really loved it. In fact, appreciated it. So our technology, you know, which um, was really used to the limit, our our mannequins and our, um, um, you know, our, our simulation. Uh, we actually got a, received a grant too to bring in uh, a new baby. Nicole, is that her name? Mm -hmm. baby, baby Tori. Oh, Tori, yeah. Yeah. Tori, yeah. sorry. Baby um, Tori. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's been a great actor. We have, um, we actually yeah, created, been well, amazing. Actually, and the, you know, um, what I wanted, we're talking over each other. Go ahead, Bonnie. Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, good. Because there was a pause. Sorry about that. Um, no, I was just going to say that um, if it weren't for the fact that simulation has become so much a part of our lives, it's just amazing to think about if something like this had happened many years ago, how would we have handled this? Because we have so many things at our fingertips. And um, like I said, the faculty and the students have adjusted so well. And just to add to what Terry was saying before, we are able to bring our students back to campus now. We're trying to in small groups, but the students have somewhat adapted so well and they're learning and they, they told me in class the other day, they actually feel like they're getting everything they need for their didactic in class, mm -hmm. as long as they get to go to clinical. So I find it interesting how much they've adapted to this. Um, mm -hmm. But personally, I can't wait to, for everybody to get back. How about you? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I like seeing their faces and you can't really do that. I like to see that they're engaged or if they have that quizzical look on their face, you know, that you need to explain things. But, you know, I've been doing a lot of advising and they're telling me that they um, are really paying attention because they realize they have to. They, you know, they, ha they have tests to, to pass. They have standardized testing that, that we do with them. So it's really yeah. important. But I am so grateful that we can bring them back to the labs uh, at Hamilton Hall yeah. and, um, and definitely the clinical setting, because I really don't think you can learn to be a nurse solely on uh, a mannequin. I think you need to be able to speak with patients and see what they're going through. Um, and so the students are telling me they're loving their time um, in, in clinical. And the, and the clinical instructors are doing their best to give them as much experience as they can in case we have to go back into quarantine again. So that's going on. Um, uh, the other thing that's going on, unfortunately, though, is that we're receiving reports of students being exposed to um, uh, COVID and we're having to quarantine them. Um, uh, we're also starting a process. We want to make sure that they can continue to go back. So we're going to be doing uh, fit testing, which is a process of making sure that the mask that they're wearing will provide them with the best protection. So we'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks um, to make sure that they can continue in their experience. So, so many, so many things because of this pandemic, but I, I think that they're continuing to learn and we're continuing to be able to provide them with um, the best possible um, uh, 
education, which is so important. Yeah, I agree. Um, maybe I can share this um, PowerPoint now with some of the things that we've been talking about, what's going on in the lab. We have some pictures when we had boot camp, just for everyone to see some things with the students, and then maybe just finish up with a couple more questions after that. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and share again. Did you I'm get pictures gonna... of the new baby room? Yep, I have all that. Oh, great. I'm going to show all that. I'm going to um, actually put it in slideshow from the current slide. And then I'm just going to advance it. Um, so I guess we can just talk a little bit about this. Terry, do you want to talk about some of the things that the students do? Well, we have a, a, a nurse, well, they started their own nursing club and they're very active and they do, um, they have fun. Like right now, I think this week they're doing a pumpkin pa uh, painting in uh, the breezeway between a couple of the buildings. So they're going to be socially distancing, but they're going to be painting pumpkins and having pizza together. So mm -hmm. that's good. But they also do a lot of service activities. So they're doing blood drives. They do a program called Dolls for Dementia, which Dr. Harvey brought in. Um, uh, there is evidence that um, if you provide dolls for people with dementia, uh, it really helps them. Uh, so the students over the past years have supplied the hospital with so many dolls and stuffed animals to be able to work with uh, our patients who have dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, they've also done food drives, coat drives, um, they're ordering sweatshirts right now with their logos on it, very proud of the program. Mm -hmm. And they're just, um, you know, they're very active. And um, I don't know, what else could we say about them? I just oh, they're fantastic. Students. Oh, it's a yeah. great, they're a very close group. Uh, they've started having a speaker series online. And I think that was uh, Catherine Harvey who came in mm -hmm. to give her, who's an alumni of the program. And she came in to just talk about her experiences um, in her program as a nurse practitioner. Uh, so they really do bring together um, the students um, and they're we have great leaders as part of the nursing club. They're just, they're fantastic. They're the heart and soul of the program. We also have an honor society, Sigma Theta Tau International. I, I joined it when I got my BSN. So I've been part of Sigma for many, many years. Um, and now I'm a member of, of this organization, our own honor society. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Cummings uh, put this together and um, got us chartered with the, the, the international uh, Sigma Theta Tau Society for Nursing. So many of our students, you have to, they have to meet, I think a 3.5 GPA uh, to get into the program. And they're mm -hmm. very excited to be part of this. Yeah, they are. They're very, very excited about this for sure. Mm -hmm. So this is just, go, ahead, go ahead. You go, Bonnie. Um, this is just uh, so before the pandemic, of course, we had a faculty, uh, Maureen Bailey, who would take the students on trips. So this is what the trip to Peru when they went in January of 19. And um, this was uh, just a group of students. And the, one of the remarkable things about this is that these students are ranged in various stages of the program. They weren't just um, you know, expert or, you know, toward the end of the program, we had freshmen, sophomores doing things. And the most amazing thing is how much care they could do there, how much hands-on, things that you wouldn't even believe they were able to see. And they came back with stories. And um, one of the most enriching things most of them said had ever occurred in their lives. And here's another picture of things that they were. So these are just students seeing populations and populations of, of people. I mean, this is really a way that you get to learn about different cultures. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I wish they could all have this experience. Yeah, maybe I agree. We'll, we'll be able to do that in the future. Yeah, I'm sure they will. So this is just more of our students. And as you can see, they have fun while they're learning. And that is the uh, Florence Nightingale Pledge at every single pinning ceremony. We say that at the end, the students and the faculty together. And it's basically been our pledge since Florence's time, mm -hmm. 250 years ago. Terry, go ahead. Would you like to speak to this? 
Oh, this is just uh, some of our simulation labs um, that we're hoping we can expand with the new building. Um, uh, simulation is really, you know, this is where they're able to practice safely. They shouldn't be practicing on patients. They need to be practicing on mannequins and that are real life that, you know, can give them like extensive experience in different types of scenarios. And then they go to the hospital and really work with real patients. So um, simulation is a really important part of our program. Mm -hmm. So we have a pediatric simulation lab area now in Hamilton Hall, and this is hanging on the wall. So this was something that I thought was uh, significant for just for everyone to see the way the students are brought into this because it is so much about the circle of life and it starts with the pediatrics. And there's our baby. And this was the uh, students during boot camp of uh, summer of 20. And as you see, um, this is the gear that they came in, the attire, the face shields, the masks. They were socially distanced. Um, and these, this was just one of those days or one of those weeks that we'll never forget about and bringing them back in. But the most important piece here is the smiles on their faces. They were so happy to be back as well, as Terry has said. Terry, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, this is this year's pinning ceremony. Pinning ceremony is at the end of the nursing program and um, the students really look forward to this. Well, we couldn't do it at the end of our program and it was kind of like heartbreaking, but the school really felt that it was important. So uh, during the summer, really hot day in the summer, we did our pinning ceremony and you can see that they were masks and they had their PPE and they were socially distanced. We also, the picture in the center is we had a drive-through graduation. So we all dressed up in our regalia and um, um, as our students came by in their cars, we were able to congratulate them. Uh, so we were really happy to be able to finally have the pinning ceremony for our graduates. So just almost getting ready to wrap it up, I just have one more question. Um, moving forward, what are your thoughts about preparing the nurse of the future? What will nursing and nursing education look like in the next five years? Well, you know, uh, what there's, things are evolving and changing so rapidly that what we teach them today may not be what they see in five years from now. So we really need to focus on helping our students hone their clinical reasoning skills so that they can think through and respond to it, you know, different and evolving patient scenarios, different illnesses that we're gonna see in the future. Not all patients are the same with the same illness, uh, although some of them may have the same illness, but it doesn't show itself in the same ways. New illnesses are emer emerging and they need to really continue to learn. They need to learn how to learn uh, into the future. We need to work on their skills in population and community health. I think we need to really focus more on that because more and more, you know, with telemedicine and more and more healthcare is gonna be delivered in the community uh, and out of the hospital. Uh, and we need to keep our communities and our populations well. And I think an important uh, component of that is to make sure that they're also taking care of themselves so that they don't burn out. And um, they need to think about how to, um, you know, take care of themselves both physically and emotionally, psychologically, you know, because as the saying goes, you need to put your own mask on before you can help others when you're on the airplane, right? So we need to focus on uh, really helping them to learn how to balance their lives and to be able to enjoy their lives. You know, mm -hmm. I can't be all work. Um, we have, um, I'm just so proud. I think the thing that I'm most proud about with our graduates, you know, I'm seeing they're going back to school, they're getting more education. So many of them are in NP program. This year we had our first doctoral uh, graduate. It's actually Dr. Harvey's daughter, um, 
Uh, Catherine Harvey got her doctorate um, this year. Um, so many of our, our graduates are receiving um, awards and recognition. Uh, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, Ke Kelly Sattler, one of our graduates, uh, recently received a system-wide award at Hackensack Meridian. She initiated a program called Nobody Dies Alone. Um, and uh, so this helps our patients who are on the, e the end stages of life. Um, and then uh, uh, another student just re received the Richard Hader Pay It Forward Award for being there for everybody. So again, and actually we have some of our uh, graduates who are now coming back and, and they're clinical instructors for us. So I'm really proud of the, of the graduates that we're pu uh, putting out. And I think we have a bright future. What do you think? I totally what are your agree. I, I totally agree. And I also think um, nursing education um, needs our graduates. And it's going to be great if we can develop an MSM program and maybe teach some of our graduates to come back to become future educators. I think that's one of the roles that we have to um, pay it forward to that, to that profession. Um, some of us are getting older, you know, we've been doing this a long time and it's, it's good to get these newer, younger um, students involved in the education process. Um, you know, it's, it's nursing is not going away. Nursing is strong and it's healthy. And I, I said to you earlier, Florence Nightingale mm -hmm. lived 250 years ago and started out with basic principles of um, healthy environments and documentation and we're still doing that. So mm -hmm. some things as the other cliche as things change but they do stay the same as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been, I'm really proud to be um, part of this whole process. And um, I guess at this point, if do you have anything else we need to add or do, um, I guess it's time for questions and I'll see yeah, if does anybody has any questions. I hope uh, you enjoyed our little presentation and any questions. I don't see anything in the chat. I don't believe. Well, all I can say is if you do think of anything, um, please reach out to us, reach out to the college. You can find our emails on the, the website. Um, it's been really a pleasure doing this. I'm glad that, um, oh, uh, Thank you both. This was wonderful. No questions. Great, great. This was fun, right? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for joining us today. And, um, you know, we were just happy to share um, our, our program. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day.